Hello, welcome to the Praying Christian Women podcast. I am Alana here with Jamie. How are you? I am good. I'm doing good. great. Anything fun or new in your neck of the woods? Well, if you're watching YouTube or Spotify video, you can see the plant in the background. I spent all day yesterday, this room that is the office, it might still sound echoey. I still have some acoustic stuff to do as we get ready, as I kind of continue, but it was kind of the catch-all for boxes of things and just the desk hadn't been fully put together. Our daughter was using it as a craft area, so it had a bunch of her stuff. So I yesterday spent a good bit of the day getting the office together. Matt got the desk put totally together, so I was able to get the bookshelf up and just kind of start getting things put where they need to be, taking stuff out that doesn't belong in here. Getting, I brought a bookcase down from upstairs that we didn't need because there was like a built-in bookcase area in the guest room. And so I brought this bookcase down. So we're going to get her craft stuff situated. So I'm super excited to have room to breathe. Like yeah. it's going to change a little bit, but I feel like working in here feels better and it just feels like I can actually not put the blur on like the last right? few <laughs> recordings. I've had the blurry background because I was like, yeah, you don't need to see who knows if I have bank documents sitting there that yeah, right? <laughs> zooming on in my piles of stuff. So, uh -huh. Anyway, no, but I'm excited. It's, it feels like a much slower process getting settled in yeah. this house than it did in other houses that we've moved in mm -hmm. partly because of our stage in life, partly because of... Right whatever, but it's getting there. So every room that we kind of transform, like last week, my brother and his wife came to visit. And so we had to get the guest room ready. Right. So, you know, that it's like one, one step at a time, getting stuff ready. It feels yeah. like home. Yeah. Well, congratulations. And actually your mention about YouTube is a good secret that a lot of people don't know is that at least lately we've been publishing the YouTube videos sooner than the podcasts. <laughs> Some of that's just because of the tech. Of it's harder to schedule. And I know it's just a couple extra buttons. But <laughs> if you can't get enough of us, you could always see sometimes YouTube will have episodes like days or a week or two early from yeah, the version it. of Easter eggs, you know, that's like, right. That's hey. right. Little known and, secret. It's like the it's like the animal style. Have you ever been you like you're a Californian, you know, in and out burger, right? Yeah. So but I don't know animal style. You didn't know they have a secret menu at In and Out. Oh, what's animal style? <laughs> I think it's just I'm not a huge in and out person. Like mm -hmm. we've only been a few times, even though they have them here. We haven't been to them yet. Um okay. but we had a friend who was from California that said In and Out has a secret menu. You can order animal style which uh -huh. means they put like a special sauce and they add Ooh. different stuff. Um, and I just recently found out Chick-fil-A, which I love Chick-fil-A. It's so good. I love their chicken. I do like cane sauce better than Chick-fil-A sauce. My family is like on the verge of disowning me for saying that. Oh no. I like cane sauce better. But Chick-fil-A has a secret menu and you can order certain things like from Chick-fil-A apparently that You'd have to Google it because I don't remember exactly what the all of them are. I know one of them is you can get an ice cream instead of a toy oh. for the Happy Meal. That's McDonald's proprietary. The meal, yeah, the <laughs> right. Meal. And I think they said you can order your chicken hot on the salad. They have a chicken, mm. like a crispy chicken mm -hmm. salad. You can request the chicken to be hot. And I think there's some sandwich stuff that you could do. But yeah. So anyway, that's it's like our secret menu. That's hilarious. Well, I wonder... <laughs> I feel like either the millennial generation is either the first to experience or the first to openly admit like ordering anxiety. <laughs> Do you ever get that? Because that sounds almost scary. What if I show up and ask for something and they think I'm just insane? But what in the world are you talking about? <laughs> I think there's a lot of that. I used to, so I, my parents both started a business. My dad is an appraiser. He, he appraises wrecked cars for insurance companies. So he started a business when I was in elementary school and my mom was the office manager. And a lot of times we would have to eat out or order out or something mm -hmm. just because she was so busy and he was so busy with the business. 
And so I, I knew how to order. Like I grew up ordering, mm. but I still had a little bit of anxiety about it. I've uh -huh. always had phone anxiety. This is what I notice about my kids, especially as our oldest has been when he was doing stuff where he would have to call to ask stuff for applications yeah. for a lot of the con communication is web-based, but some mm -hmm. of it is you have to call and you have to yeah. schedule this or you have to whatever. And I know he was just like, I hate being on the phone. I don't like talking on the phone. It feels awkward. Mm -hmm. I've always had that though, even being a child of the eighties where phone yeah. was everything other than close friends and family, like, and even sometimes then I have a weird aversion to the phone. So yeah. I think there's a lot of generational and additionally COVID related face-to-face -face mm -hmm. interaction anxiety that probably yeah, has happened. Definitely. But yeah, definitely generational. But I think on top of it, my personality is like that anyway. So I struggled even though I grew up. Yeah. With it. Yeah. Of our three kids, it's so funny because Two of our kids, not that they love it, but they've ordered, if I'll say, hey, order us two large pizzas or that kind of thing, they've done it. One of them has a store in Anchorage that they really like. It's a record store. And he went through a season where, you know, every couple months he would save up his money and then he would just call the store and chat with the guy and be like, hey, what, what records do you have by this band? And they just rattle it off and he'd order it online. And then We've got one more who's our most social and our most extroverted. And even as a little kid could go to the playground and leave with 10 new friends. And he's terrified. He called to make a hair appointment and kind of froze. <laughs> and he just looked at me. He's, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? Yeah. No, it's, yeah. it is really, it can be intimidating. By the way, mm -hmm. I'm like placing all of the kids as you're like, I know, I didn't want to say, like, I know what like kid. age order, but you know who I'm talking about. I know who you're talking about. Well, <laughs> yeah, no, it is definitely like our oldest had to leave a message. Well, he was mm -hmm. calling about an interview for the, for one of the Academy interviews that he had. And he mm -hmm. was calling to, I don't remember, follow up and make sure they got his application. Okay. Oh, and uh -huh. He had, and, but I had to prepare him because I mm -hmm. knew that he might freeze mm -hmm. up. What if you get an answering machine or it's not, see that dates me. What if you get an, a message that you need to, because right. there's no machine, but right. what if you get an answering service and have to leave a message? Right. And so we had to kind of go through a little script and yeah. practice. Mm -hmm. No, it really, yeah, it's, in, it's things that you don't think about really yeah. teaching. And mm -hmm. then it comes to the thing that happens and you're just thinking, oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. You need to get prepared for that. That doesn't just come second nature. Exactly. And I think it's a good reminder to actually take this into something where there could be a takeaway for listeners besides this jibber jabbering. I think it's a good reminder that just because something comes naturally to some people, there are others who it is a scary thing to do. You know, I'm not scared of public speaking, but a lot of people are. And so it's, but I'm, I'm, <laughs> terrified. I was in Scott's class. I subbed for one of the resource teachers. And part of my job for that day was to sit in my husband's middle school class and kind of be there to support his students. And they've got this huge screen. It's probably like a six feet across. And I'm sure I'm exaggerating because it was blown up in my mind. He's mm -hmm. teaching, he's lecturing about fractions. And on this huge screen that in my brain takes up the entire wall, a screensaver comes on. <laughs> And it's all these fish swimming around. Oh, and, no. And, like, I had to be an adult. And I had to just, I'm not going to look at it. But even knowing it was there was hard. So, yeah, I'm not scared of A, but I'm terrified of B, which nobody in the world is terrified of fish. I, I know it actually, it is a phobia. There are a couple people I've met who are like, oh, yeah, I get that too. But yeah, no, well, I'm picturing now, like the parallel to me would be as a huge screen with spiders crawling across it. Yeah, it would freak yeah. the heck out of me. Yeah. And so we've got to be just gentle. I think, especially with our kids, they do have different life experiences than us. So if it's, hey, why is going to the store and handing someone a $5 bill to pay for your groceries? That should be really easy. Not that anybody can buy groceries for $5, but like for their snack. <laughs> but for some people, maybe that's really scary. Or I was at a school event and bought something from concessions and there were no coins. It was all bills. 
but the person kind of froze when it came to giving me change because it was a little more complex. And I had right. you a 20 for something that costs 10, right? right? And my first thought was like, okay, like this doesn't, you need to remind yourself things that are easy for you aren't necessarily easy for others. And some of that is constitution. Some of that is generational. Like how much class time did you and I have about giving change? Like. <laughs> It was a lot. I even had a little video game on the Atari where I was like this little bear in this little general store and like people would come and buy things and I had to figure out what change they got. Now it's not really, I mean, it's not as important of a life skill. And so it's not as emphasized. Yeah. We're a digital based society. Well, another takeaway from that, I feel, and this all kind of comes back to what we talk about a lot about women and having grace with each other and supporting each other, but also appreciating your strengths and not comparing yourself to others because I guarantee that if you're struggling with something like anxiety about ordering or whatever, you're assuming that everyone else is fine with it. But just mm-hmm. because it looks easy for other people doesn't mean that it is. Yeah. My, my kids, my two younger kids who are pretty social in general is our youngest, but, but they have expressed how different difficult it is to talk to people like having small talk and I mean yeah. it's just socially especially after just moving and mm. I said something to them and I was like yeah it I actually have had to I'm extremely shy extremely self-conscious in general and I just can look back over the course of my life I have had to create like an exterior of being talkative and chatty to mm-hmm. overcome my anxiety about talking to people because I have, uh, I have fears of saying the wrong thing. I used to, people used to joke all the time about my quote, blonde moments. Cause I was very Aww. blonde when I was younger. Yeah. I have some blonde moments. I say things yeah. without thinking, or I'll say the wrong thing, or I'll say something that sounds a little bit like, oh, really? You didn't know that. And I've learned to mask it a little bit, but I still do it. And I still am very self-conscious and my kids were shocked. They're like, you are the most Mm -hmm. like chatty, friendly person. We know you're outgoing. You talk to people all the time. And I told them like, I have created that. That's a defense mechanism or maybe a protective mechanism. I've had to learn like the art of Mm -hmm. talking to people and I'm not really good at it all the time. And sometimes I'm better than others, but they were shocked to know that. And it's, and I think for them, it was a revelation and also comforting for them to know that Mm. I struggle with it too. And that I'm scared when I'm in new situations, even like just going to their school to volunteer for something Mm. or especially to go to their school to volunteer for something when I don't know the moms or dads. Yeah. Yeah. I think creating that persona, creating the, Hey, I'm somebody who can do this. I remember when I was on the paper staff for our college newspaper I did the art section. So I was in charge of going to see shows and publishing the reviews for them or people when a new album came out, they would drop a review or a book reviews. So it wasn't investigative. It wasn't calling people up for interviews, but I was watching the guy who was the news editorial staff or the news editor. And he would have to call and follow up on like very cold leads and He was kind of like you and me, he like, he was shy. He didn't like it. But so basically when he picked up the phone, he created the persona of a like hard boiled investigative journalist. (laughs) And he just let that little like inner persona come out. And it does add a layer of protection because then it's, well, if somebody gets grumpy Or, you know, if you get tongue tied and you feel a little embarrassed, it's almost like it's one degree removed from you, you know? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So I have no idea how this is going to tie in, but let's pretend we had an amazingly smooth segue into our continuing series about the prayer life of the Proverbs 31 woman. Today, we're going to start at verse 25. So I'll just go ahead and read the next couple verses. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. So here's a just for fun that I love to do just kind of as a regular reflection. It's almost in the similar spirit of getting into a daily gratitude habit. 
when is, let's call it like in the last month, when is a time that you have laughed really hard? Oh, I know it had to do with something my daughter showed me. It was a video. Oh, okay. I've got one. Okay. So, so our old, there was a time and I can't think of the video that she showed me or something that she said and I misunderstood. I don't know. We laughed really hard recently, but this is one I remember the details of our, our oldest is away at school. And so he was really missing our dog. Yeah. And he said, can you send a picture of the dog? I really miss him. It'll cheer me up. I'm in the middle of studying and it's lame. So our middle son discovered long ago, this picture of the world's fattest Labrador retriever. Oh no. And if you Google it, I'm going to do that while you're telling me the story. I think you'll find it. I think so. Let me know if you don't find it, but I think it's world's fattest Labrador. <laughs> it's, looks like a manatee and i mean it's kind of oh, there's a little guy did you That's see him kind of he's so yeah, but it's cute kind of sad. well i know okay so some people out there are going to be like you're laughing oh. at the misfortune of this morbidly obese dog a um, little thing but or big thing in my just twisted sense of humor uh-huh. i said okay oh. you said him that <laughs> but i'm warning you He's put on a few pounds Aww. since we moved. <laughs> and so I sent him the picture, which he has seen the picture before. He knew it wasn't our dog. Yeah. But and so I sent the pic- <laughs> So I sent the picture. And so he texts back like the sad frowny face, not uh-huh. the I don't know what it is. There's something about like the frowny face with the like total frown, not just the sort of sad. But the light be really upside down Uh brown with no tears or anything. And it was, yeah, it's just more somber and serious to me than the other one. So, yeah, he was very sad that I said that. So I went ahead and I took a picture of the actual dog. But that, I cracked myself up. And I will have to say that I have this thing where I slay me. Like, I laugh so hard at my own jokes that most people don't think are that funny so Mm -hmm. i laughed pretty hard at that one i was pretty pleased with myself i don't think my son really appreciated the humor how about you well your story reminded me i was in a text thread with our oldest off at college and scott my husband and i was just asking how's how's your week going and stuff like that and then we were talking about halloween and what his plans are and i was just being silly i was wearing my pink fuzzy bathrobe and my son also likes dog pics i'm sending him like multiple times a week mine are unsolicited dog pics so you need to up your game you if your son's asking you for the dog pics you're not (laughs) sending him enough well, I'm afraid that it might make him sadder. That's Aww, my thing. Is it going to make it worse or better? So we uh-huh. had the conversation. He's, it makes me a little sad, but send the stinking dog pictures. Yeah. So you're right. He wants them. So I, as a joke, took a picture of myself with two of the three dogs snuggling me. And I said, well, I'm going for Halloween as a dog owner in a pink bathrobe. And since my husband is also on the text thread, He responds, oh, are you going as a sexy dog owner? So what I did, I took off my glasses. I pulled my hair out of its bun. I took the same exact picture. I'm like, now I'm a sexy dog owner because, you know, I have my hair down, my glasses off, and I'm still in my pink bathrobe, but apparently that's what does it. So, and how did your son feel about that? Was he like, yeah, it TMI. was fine after that. <laughs> yeah, keep it to your own text thread, But please. they're kind of used to us making funny jokes like I that. I know, so. that's cute. I love it. So, but yeah, I think in the same way that like getting in the regular habit of asking yourself, what can I thank the Lord for? I think part of that can be like, what has made me laugh lately? And so if you're looking for one more thing to add to an end of the day prayer routine or something like that, or you're just like bored trying to have a little reflection time, or you want to add it to a weekly prayer journal experience, I think it can be a really powerful tool to remember. So I read somewhere that we remember negative events about three times more strongly 
than a positive event. Yep. Um, so it's kind too. of like you need to remind yourself of happy times three times in order to almost like cancel out one negative <laughs> memory. Not that it cancels out, but I think you know what I mean. So yeah, that's one thing. I think out of all of Proverbs 31, the verses I really love and resonate with is one we talked about a couple of weeks ago where it talks about she works with eager hands. And I've always had the picture of those praying hands. And then mm -hmm. this is also one I just love. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at days to come. I see both of those sides as just being so it's not she's clothed in like the latest fashion or she can make herself look like she's got a thousand dollar budget on a five dollar thrift store. Fine. It's not about the physical clothes she's wearing. It's about how she carries herself. What you were saying with your kids, like you can portray a confidence and that can have an effect on those around you and on yourself. And then I love, she can laugh at the days to come. Cause I don't really picture this as like snarky or like full of herself. I think of this as just joyful. Like my grandma, like she was, she knew the best was ahead of her, no matter what it was. And she had some bad health issues, you know, for probably a good year and a half or two years before she died. She spent some, a lot of that time in a nursing home. She had several like periods where she had to go to the hospital for heart issues. And she still just laughed at days to come. And it wasn't just, I know I'm off to heaven soon. It really was like, oh, today my heart might stop. And isn't that going to be a fun adventure? <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, well, it's a little scary, but so before we go too deep into it, do you want to pray for our discussion and then we can jump in even more? Sounds good. Father, we just thank you for another opportunity to come together and just talk about Proverbs 31. As always, there's just so much to glean from so few passages. And we thank you that your word is living and active. We thank you that it's sharper than a double-edged sword, that it can penetrate our hearts, that it can help us discern things about ourselves, both good and bad. And we just pray as always that you would use these things not to condemn us, but that it would just encourage us and inspire us to move forward in just seeking to become more and more like Jesus. And with your help and with your grace and with the power of your Holy Spirit, we just thank you and are so happy that we have that hope and that promise in Jesus name. Amen. Well, I love what you said about, I, I love that you brought that up because I read that first part as strength and dignity and she can laugh at the days to come because she's so strong and dignified. Mm. Ah. Right, no. almost defiant, right? Yes, but what I love about this is it highlights the fact that strength and dignity doesn't negate the, or it doesn't prevent, no, what's the word I'm thinking? It basically Diminish. means that, di what is it? Diminish. Is that what Diminish. You're so no. just because we're dignified, that doesn't prevent us from, or block us from the ability to laugh and to be yeah even frivolous sometimes and right. i love that because i think so many times we think of the proverbs 31 woman or even as christian women and i mean i'm saying this because i've done this and i've pictured this and i've fallen into this trap of thinking in order to be a real true praying christian woman christian women <laughs> Mowage is what brings right. us together all today. Um, I need to be serious. I need to be stoic. Right. I need to be mm -hmm. somber and prayerful. And this goes in our marriages too, I think, where we feel like it's the age old like dichotomy between being a good Christian wife and a good Christian girl and the flip side of being a sexual and even right. playful partner. I think we have a lot of blocks there. I know I do. And so I love that you brought that up. And there's this contrast between, and not even contrast between the two things. It's like embracing both sides of your Proverbs 31-ness as being mm -hmm. both strong and dignified and carrying yourself with dignity. Yeah, you don't want to just be 
you know, making fart jokes all the time with everybody around. I mean, well, maybe means, you do, <laughs> but maybe you do with some people. And not you're, others. I could see if you're a middle school youth group leader. I mean, that could be your spiritual gift. Well-timed fart jokes. Right. And so you, I think that's a good point. Timing in the room and, <laughs> right. you know, but dignity doesn't have to mean that you're sacrificing playfulness and for sure. joy and joking around and laughter. Yeah. I love that. Thank you for bringing that up. Well, no, I love it too, because, you know, even I love how we talk so much about just the different research and science and sociology and all of that. And like when you're public speaking, adding humor makes such a difference. Yeah. It's not frivolous. It truly is a means to connect with people. And so I'm even picturing we, I grew up with Pastor Larry and he was the pastor of this church for 35 or 40 years. And he just retired like a couple of years ago. And so I grew up under Pastor Larry and he would always start the sermons with a really bad dad joke, you know, but they were a Pastor Larry joke. Let me think a couple of them that I remember just to show you how stupid they are. Here's one. So there was a plane and they overbooked the flight. And so they asked for five volunteers to hold on to the bottom wheels of the plane and just travel by holding on to the plane and just floating on it. And so a family of four and a single man all agreed that they would be the ones to spend the entire flight suspended in air holding to the bottom of the plane. And once they like the flight took off they're thousands of feet above ground the single guy and the family's just kind of talking to each other and the family asked the single guy hey so so we really needed the money to because they gave him a reward to give up their seats and just fly by holding on to the plane it's like we really needed the money why is it that you decided to give up your seat on the plane and he started talking about this really sad story about how he was raising money for orphans and he was going on this like mission trip to support these people and the family was so touched that they all gave him like a big round of applause and that's the end of the joke do you get it oh i get it <laughs> they found because they're all <laughs> hanging on to the bottom of the plane Oh my goodness. Yeah. This is how dumb Pastor Larry's jokes are. I heard that joke. It had to be in the 1980s. <laughs> like it couldn't have been any, and I remember it, right? I yeah. I don't remember a single sermon. I don't remember a Bible lesson, but I remember that really dumb story. And so I think it is important to remember our community I will phrase this as kind of a prayer request. Our community had a tragedy that impacted just about everybody in the public school system where my husband is now teaching. And so I texted him midday. I'm just kind of like, how are things going at the school? How are, you know, how are you? How are your students? How are the other staff? And he said, well, we just spent the last period watching cute animal videos. And that is the best use of their time that day. You know, it, it truly was. And I know back when our kids were little and we were homeschooling, it was, that is exactly how we reset a day if we needed it. If everybody was grouchy or if people couldn't focus, or if there was just so much brain fog, that is what gave us the mental reset we needed. So I don't think that anybody should feel guilty for seeking out what feels like dumb or frivolous humor. And I think that we could all do well to almost elevate stupid dog videos or whatever your equivalent might be, right? The silly things that make you laugh do have such an importance in our life. Yeah, I totally agree. I have a question. So going back to strength and dignity, I'm just curious, what does that look like? I know everyone is different, but for you personally, what would you think? And I have an idea too, if you need time to think, but what do you think about what comes to mind when you think about strength and dignity as a woman? Think of dignity as somebody who doesn't get embarrassed easily. 
You know, but we start, this is our segue when we talked about, I'm embarrassed to make this order. I was I'm thinking that too. Yeah. yeah I'm embarrassed. I'm going to make a mistake when I talk on the phone or something like that. I think when you have dignity, you're, you're putting one foot in front of the other. You're not second guessing. Oh, did I make, did I misstep? Did I do that wrong? Was somebody watching me? You know, it's just the sense of this is who I am. I recognize that I'm not perfect. I recognize that not everybody's going to love me and want to be my very best friend in the world. And I recognize, I think some of dignity is also recognizing the dignity in others, right? Mm-hmm. I recognize that you have value because you are a human being created in God's image. That's what I picture for dignity. And then, yeah, the strength, I think, kind of goes with that. It's it that does, yeah. that quality of I'm not thrown off by small inconveniences or small slights. I'm not plagued by, you know, I'm not barraged 500 times an hour by critical thoughts or these nagging doubts. I've learned not that those might not be there, but I've learned to keep on walking and tune them out. Right. What's your picture? Yeah. A lot of the same things The I, I picture as you were talking Pretty much what you're saying is almost the exact opposite of being a people pleaser. It's yes. it's someone who is focused on pleasing God. And I think that's where the dignity and the strength come from in this case would be God is the one. You're secure in who God is mm-hmm. and what your mission is and that it depends mm-hmm. on what God wants of you and not on anyone else's agenda or expectations in the big picture. I mean, that doesn't mean that there's not... I think you can... You could take it too far and become prideful or self, not not self-involved, what would it be? Prideful or, I don't know, inconsiderate. So, but. Right, right. You're not rude. You're not rude and, you know, you're not, and it's, you know, love does not boast, does not envy, does not boast, is not proud, all of those things. But, but yeah, it's the exact opposite of people pleasing. It's, am I now a servant of, or am I now trying to please men or am I trying to please God? If I were still trying to please people, I wouldn't be a servant of Christ, Paul says. And I think it's definitely what I strive to be. And I really, as you were talking, I'm like, I've made progress. I've seen God doing a work in me as I've gotten older, even in the last probably five to 10 years, I can see a transformation of where my focus is. And some of that might just be that I'm getting so old. I'm sick of worrying about everybody yeah, else. Yeah, it definitely can turn into that, which I think is a gift. But I'm hoping that it's God just making me more like Christ. The thing that came to my mind when it's she is strength and dignity is just this idea of, I'm totally drawing a blank because I really liked what you said. So hang on for one second and let me go back on my train of thought. Hold on a second. Okay. Okay, so when I was thinking about dignity, I was thinking a lot about in relationship to our kids, in relationship to our spouse, and in relationship to the other people around us. And so I think it was very similar to what you were saying. I think it it had to do with just this confidence and Mm -hmm. the knowledge that, I don't know, just the knowledge that, that you are God's and that you have intrinsic value Mm -hmm. that you're not going around trying to work your way into the approval of yourself or anyone else that you have intrinsic value and i think when you carry yourself that way oh i know what i was going to say part of dignity isn't doing everything perfectly and being Mm -hmm. dignified because you are the perfect example of everything, right. but it is owning your mistakes. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, the example absolutely. came because our son recently made a mistake at school and they're more heavy handed there at West Point with, you know, if you sleep through a class, you have like actual, you have to go before like a student, like what, a, not a student, but a cadet, like discipline board. Like it's not just, Mm -hmm. oh, I missed it. I slept through a class. I'll just get notes from someone. Like it's pretty big deal. Very big deal. He didn't do that, but he did. There was, he lost something important temporarily. He did end up finding Mm -hmm. it. He didn't find it. It's like a card that they needed and he didn't find it in time 
to not have to tell someone about it. So he yeah. found it like right after he had to own up to it. And he <laughs> was kind of terrified. He was afraid yeah. that he would get in big trouble. He didn't know what was going to happen if he would have to, like they have these walking hours they have to do or minutes, I don't know. But the one piece of advice that my husband gave him was whatever you do, own your mistake. Yeah. And that is going to take you so much further than trying to skirt away from it or making excuses for why it happened. Exactly. Own it, own it and don't try to skirt or avoid yeah. the consequences. And I think mm -hmm. as a woman, the biggest part of that dignity, I think, aside from having that confidence rooted in who you are in Christ is owning mistakes and walking in your mistakes with dignity which means yeah. not making mistakes so i mean there have been times when i have acted in a way that i'm not proud of in front of my kids mm -hmm. and there have been times when i've been so mad during the aftermath that i've made excuses and then right. i had to go back and say that wasn't I, like there's no mm -hmm. excuse for that but the dignity comes from getting to the for me my goal and aspiration is to just as quickly as possible own up to my mistakes and to walk in them and, and to walk out either the consequence of it or the repair for whatever yeah. happened that i had to change whether it's apology whether it's confession mm -hmm. whether it's whatever but doing that yeah. in a way that's owning it and I just think that's so powerful to, for our it kids is. to see, mm -hmm. I don't do it perfectly, but I aspire to, you know, and I think better. in addition to everything you said, there's also the sense of holding your own dignity in your own mind. Right. And so, yeah, I made a fool of myself. Like I, I tripped on stage and my skirt fell up and 50 people saw my panty liners or something like that. That's <laughs> super embarrassing. How do you recover from that? Well, you just need to get back up. A lot of performers would find some kind of joke to laugh it off. We, I actually saw a woman do this. I think she was a gospel singer, if I remember right. And we went to this concert when I was a teen. I think she did. She slipped or she fell and she wasn't injured, but she got back up and she said, well, I guess that teaches me not to pray for humility right before a show, you know, That's and so everybody good. laughed and then she just went on. Right. And I see that as dignity. You stumble, you laugh. And then you move on. So it, the worst thing that could have happened is she got into her brain and second guessed herself the entire rest of the show. I was like, these people are going to remember this forever. I am never going to recover from this. You just got to go forward. The only time I really flubbed a violin recital, I was probably around 10th grade. And the piece I was playing had a section that repeated once, but then changed to the end, which is fairly common in music. And I got kind of in a loop where I repeated it twice and multiple and times. Recover. Yeah. And so my teacher was accompanying mom on the piano. We both had to stop and look at each other and be like, okay, I'm going to start over from here. And I had a friend, my mom's friend was at the show and she came to me afterwards. And what I loved, because I got, I got to where I wasn't embarrassed because I think I had done enough performing at that point that if, it, and this is kind of sad, if anything, I was like, I hope my parents aren't going to yell at me, which they wouldn't have, but in, in a kid's brain, that's probably right. more what was going on in my head. So my mom's friend came up to me and the first thing she said was, I'm not going to pretend like you didn't make a mistake. It was too big of a mistake. Everybody noticed. She didn't say that, but we both, she just got the elephant like right there. And then she said, but when you started up again, I felt so much more freedom from you. And I noticed that mm -hmm. too, even though at that point, I'm not sure I even would have had the language to express it. But when I first started, I was in my head, which is why I got into this loop and how I, I made that mistake. After that, it was, well, the worst thing that could have happened already happened. So now I'm just going to play for the love of the music. And this other woman in the audience could see that and noticed that. And I think that's, that's kind of dignity too. Yeah, we're all going to make a mistake, but the worst thing to do is five years later, to still be kicking yourself for that one mistake and never moving on. So there's a dignity. I feel like the way my mom's friend handled that is a perfect example of dignity, right? I mean, she could have just come up and said, Hey, great job, Alana. I really liked it. 
and it would have felt a tiny bit awkward because neither of us were addressing it, but she, I mean, she came right out, but she was so gracious. And then she told me what I kind of already sensed, but wouldn't have been able to articulate. And that after you flubbed up, it got way better. (laughs) Isn't that is such, that's a key point. I love that because think about your journal, you know, your prayer journal, when you get a brand new one, you're so afraid of it not being perfectly written. Oh. You don't want to scratch mm-hmm. anything out. You want your handwriting mm-hmm. to be good. Yeah. And then by the time I get to the end, at least, I don't know about you, but mine's like chicken scratch Yeah. at times. But when you first start, you're just so afraid. You're holding on mm-hmm. tightly to this handwriting. Yeah. And yeah. then, and I even notice sometimes when I'm rewriting, rereading my journals, that Mm -hmm. those initial pages aren't as heartfelt because I'm so formal in everything. Yeah, exactly. And flowery. And, but then I make a mistake and it's the first time I scratch something out and I'm like, well, (laughs) might as well just pour my heart out and chicken scratch. And those words are so much more beautiful and sincere and genuine. And my Mm -hmm. stream of conscious thought that I don't really take the time to put grammatic grammatical, whatever polish on, they're Mm. so much more free. And I think that is true with every single thing in our lives. And I think our prayer life is the same way. There are things in our prayer lives that we hold on to so tightly. And I am speaking from like very direct experience and recent experience of, I want this to go this way. I Mm -hmm. want this to look this way. And then And I have this, I I don't know even what, how to put it into words. It's almost like part of my faith is hinging on that result. And part of my faith is on what happens. And my relationship with God is strained in those cases to the point where, because I know that I'm not trusting in him, I have this false hope that will, my hopes will be dashed if this thing doesn't work out the way I'm praying. And when it doesn't work out or when I have an unanswered prayer that I have to wrestle through, I just feel like it just opens up this genuine relationship with God because it's imperfect. It's messy. And so what else? There's nothing to lose. It's kind of like your passion was poured into that piece because you didn't mind if you tripped up a couple of notes. You just wanted Mm -hmm. to play for the love of the music. And I think our relationship with God is so similar. Yeah. And and I think that it just has those same qualities of, yeah. So dignity in any realm of life, I think one of the keys is failing with dignity. Yeah. Failing gracefully, I think is really important. You're not going to get mad at somebody else. You're not going to blame someone else for your mistake and you're not going to keep on beating yourself up. Right. Yeah. Have I told you my trick for breaking in a new journal that I'm nervous to write in? I want to know. I might have heard this in our journaling series, but I want to know. I deliberately will make a mistake in the first page. I will like deliberately make something where it's not on a straight line or I misspell something and have to cross it out and then rewrite it. Or I'll start with a blue pen, but then switch to a black pen. You know, That is so (laughs) wise. That's good. I love it. So yeah, because there is this sense of if you are given a beautiful blank journal, that is a heavy weight for some people, you know, it's like, this has got to be perfect. I remember as a teen, I read a biography of George Mueller and was so inspired by his prayer life that I made it my goal. And I doubt this lasted for longer than half a day, but for a quick moment, my goal was I want to pray prayers with a hundred percent success rate, basically, right? I never want to pray a prayer that God won't answer. Well, wow. oh, that make me so cool. <laughs> and But if you're doing that, you're going to be either sorely disappointed very soon, or you're going to get really cocky and start dictating to God how things must go. But then he's going to humble you pretty dramatically, or you're going to be so scared to pray for anything that you're just paralyzed, right? If my goal is to never pray a prayer that God won't answer, and for every single, like 100% of the prayers I pray to be like a guaranteed yes, <laughs> and, I, and I'm and i doing it for my own success rate so I can be like George Mueller, <laughs> then I'm not going to pray audacious prayers. I'm going to pray 
the quick thing, dear God, please help the sun to rise today, <laughs> right? Amen. And if that's my only prayer prayed that day, then that is success. So on a note, going back to the humor side of things, I'm not the, well, it is humor, <laughs> humor and dignity, I guess. Have you ever seen the movie called Joyful Noise? Remind me. I don't think so. But okay. What is that? So basically the next time we are physically in the same location together, that is going to be our That's evening be our movie to movie watch. Night. Okay. Because it is, it's Queen Latifah, who I know you really like. I love her. And it's Dolly Parton. And What? Yes. And they are. How do I not they, know about this movie? I know. Basically they are both wanting to be like the head choir master for this gospel choir and oh it's gosh. really cute it is not a christian movie even though it's like a church choir it's a probably a typical pg-13 comedy yeah, kind of like but sister it, act isn't religious exactly but good music <laughs> and it can definitely help you get your praise on oh <laughs> my gosh the music. how do i not know that those two people that i love are in a movie together i know so <laughs> but i want to share a quote i looked it up when we took a quick break so this is my another picture i have of dignity. So Queen Latifah is talking to her daughter. The movie came out in like the early 20 teens. Curvy, curviness in women is much more acceptable and considered to be like attractive today, way more so than it was when she's talking. And so I think it also helps to keep that in mind. And she's talking, Queen Latifah's character is talking to her teenage daughter about looks and dress and modesty and what I think really encompasses this verse we've been talking about. Queen Latifah says, I am an incandescent board certified supermodel, baby. <laughs> and then she says, I could hang myself. You no, know, where does it go? I could hang mirrors all over the house if I wanted just to look at myself. I happen not to flaunt it because I'm a married woman and would never disrespect my husband that way. And so to me, that is dignity. It's knowing how amazingly attractive or, you know, like, but it doesn't have to just be in how you look. Intelligent. It's knowing how amazing, yes. It's knowing how amazingly perfect <laughs> you are, but also knowing that you don't need to flaunt it and that in, if you did flaunt it, it would be disrespectful. So I loved that picture. I'll read it one more time just because I love the way she puts it. I am an incandescent board certified supermodel. I happen not to flaunt it because I'm a married woman and I would never disrespect my husband that way. And just knowing your worth, but not having to present it, right? Not having to be fawned over because of it, but knowing that you have intrinsic worth because God is your father. Yeah. And looking at Jesus, he's the perfect picture of that. And, you know, and realizing that there's a difference between dignity and being pompous because I think some people sure. will put the picture of like kind of a pompous or I don't know that's I guess pompous or yeah like ostentatious person mm -hmm. like putting themselves mm -hmm. out there and, and putting this facade of importance to themselves mm -hmm. and, and mistake that for dignity right but I love that you kind of bring up like dignity is in you. It's inside. It has nothing mm -hmm. to do with the way it's the way you carry yourself because of your confidence in who you are in Christ and like the things we talked about. And the thing that occurred to me was that the two things that we talked about that are either barriers to dignity or maybe even the antithesis of dignity are people pleasing and perfectionism. Because yes. if we think we need to be perfect, if we think we need to please other people, if we're constant, I mean, there is a benefit to the quality in me that can be twisted into people pleasing, which is mm -hmm. always sending out feelers. It's an empath empathetic quality mm -hmm. to try to empathize with people or resonate with their feelings. Yeah, or assess um, where they are. Wanting people to, wanting to encourage people, being an encourager goes along with that. I love calling people out on things that maybe they don't even know they're good at or, you know, are qualities that are good about them. I take joy in those things. 
But when those two things together get kind of twisted up, it can turn into people pleasing and insecurity. Yeah. And so anyway, perfectionism and people pleasing are yeah. enemies of, and maybe even the antithesis to strength and dignity. Absolutely. And I would add one more, and that would be just self-criticism, you know, like yeah. just ongoing self-criticism. One mm-hmm. book I read that it, and this was just like the author threw it out as an aside and took all of two sentences, but I really loved it. And that was, if you are struggling with your own confidence or with your own self-worth or, you know, or you're just self-conscious of your appearance, the best trick I have ever heard is train yourself so that whenever you see any woman, especially one who does not fit whatever like today or this season standards of extreme beauty is to look at her and have your very first mental reaction be, she is so beautiful. Yeah. And then oh, once you learn how to do that to other women, you learn how to look in the mirror and it becomes that automatic trigger, right? If I can look at a hundred different women who look a hundred different ways and I can train myself that my very first reaction to every single one of them is she is so beautiful, then you can train yourself <laughs> to, to see that about yourself too. I've never heard that. And I think yeah. that is pretty cool. That's maybe even revolutionary because it can be applied it to really a, lot, felt- a lot of different scenarios. Cause I've heard other people say, well, Im- imagine criticizing other people with the words that you're Mm. saying to yourself. And that is sad. Mm -hmm. Or imagine Mm -hmm. saying that to Mm. your daughter or to your younger self as a child. I've never heard of that, like just practical repetition of training your brain to call out beauty in others. Yeah. And having that translate to you. That's pretty, pretty Well, this woman, what she does, she does this in live training since she's basically got a slideshow of women from all backgrounds, all ages, And every participant in the room must say out loud with each picture, she is so beautiful. And basically everybody's sobbing by the end because you do realize like that's a really powerful way to learn to admire, which takes us back to the entire crux of Proverbs 31 is being a celebration of all women, right? And so we can take that also and extrapolate it, not just to someone being beautiful, but maybe, you know, if you get into mommy wars, <laughs> look at a picture of a woman breastfeeding, look at a picture of a woman bottle feeding, train yourself to say, what a beautiful mother, right? Or see a picture of a woman at work in a corporate office and see a picture of a woman staying at home, mopping floors and train yourself to say, what a beautiful woman, right? Or what a strong woman or whatever kind of word is going to resonate with you. Learn how to extend that. Cause I think a lot of us, we're so good as women about putting others needs before ours. So sometimes training yourself to call out the beauty in other women <laughs> comes more naturally. I think for everybody, it's going to come more naturally than calling out the beauty or self-worth that's inside of you. But when you train yourself to call it out in others, then it's easier to extend it to you. So maybe another way we could take this kind of example or exercise, like maybe the next time you're at the store, just see every single woman who's shopping and try to call out one, one beautiful thing. So the haggard mom with the really badly behaved toddler, just say, what a strong woman. And the old woman who can barely afford to feed herself and is, you know, buying ramen, what a strong woman. Or, you know, the beautiful, gorgeous supermodel who's there with her very attractive boyfriend, what a strong woman. And that teaches us to appreciate and celebrate the, just kind of the vastness of women's, help me out. (laughs) It helps us to appreciate diversity, the diversity of beautiful, strong women and how that doesn't just mean one thing. Yeah. And it's almost harder. I think sometimes for us as women to call out good things and people that were like, well, she already has all that good stuff. Why am I going to call out more? Right. You know, I don't know. And maybe I'm the only one again, I'm confessing I think it, that I think it can it's be true, very yeah. hard. I think our mind naturally, no matter how well-meaning we are, is almost like the jealousy, the underlying mm-hmm. jealousy or envy prevents us from wanting 
to call out good things in someone you already, you're like, well, she already has so much good stuff. Why do I need to call mm -hmm. it out? <laughs> yeah. But well, there's so I, much. Go ahead. I think it goes back again. We're tying it back to all of the chit chat we had. I think that's what, how blonde jokes became a cultural thing. And I'm so glad that they're not anymore. <laughs> you know, they're at least phasing out, but they're still being funny. a woman, they're still really funny <laughs> being a, a woman in Western society with blonde hair for a long time kind of meant that you were considered the most attractive. And so other women had to come up with, well, yeah, she might have blonde hair, but she's probably stupid. <laughs> you know, like we, we had to, not that we had to, but we were almost trained to say, oh, right. well, nobody's lucky enough to have conventional good looks and be smart. And so let's, and I think it's important for us to look at that. Like I'm finally on Instagram and some, and again, I love it for the dog videos. I love it for some of the comedy stuff that comes up. But sometimes it breaks my heart. Like I saw a mom reenacting like her 13 year old daughter's hormonal meltdown as a, isn't this so funny? Aren't girls insane? And it just broke my heart that we treat that as funny. Do you know what I mean? That's not supposed to be, that's not empathy, right? So I think that's useful too, you know, bringing it back to the humor side of things. God, God gave us humor. Humor is a gift. Jesus had some pretty funny jokes, like the camel and the eye of the needle and, you know, just like silly things he'd say like that, but it wasn't tearing others down. And I think that's also something just kind of important to, to keep in mind with all of this, because as women... We have been kind of trained to either be tearing ourselves down or tearing others down. And that's not the heart of Proverbs 31, right? It's a celebration of all women. Yeah. And look at us. We didn't even get to verse the second verse. <laughs> I know. <laughs> she speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. Amen. Thanks for joining us, everybody. So I think this is a good place to wrap up, though. I uh, so... Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Listener homework, find the funniest dog video or cat video or baby video. There was a whole trend of babies just laughing their heads off at the sound of tape being like pulled, like packing tape being pulled. Like apparently babies find it the funniest sound in the world. Like just go find something that's going to make you laugh for a couple of minutes. That is the listener homework we will leave you with and we'll talk to you all next time.